I expect I've said several times in your hearing that my mother, who was almost 19 when I was born, started taking me to the Church of Christ when I was zero. And I've been a few times since then. Uh, sometimes you hear good things, sometimes you hear things that uh, may not be all that good. But every once in a while in our Christian life, there is a surprise that's especially nice. One of my favorites is to hear somebody read the Bible who is particularly gifted. There's Charlton Heston and James Earl Jones, and you could name lots of others. One of my very favorites is named John Thompson. He was a dear colleague of mine at OC. He died prematurely. He was a large black man with a booming voice. And when he read, God said, let there be light, you expected it to come on. <laughs> I'm about to read from the Bible. I'm not Charlton Heston or John Thompson. I'm 85 years old, and I've got a raspy, tender voice. Nevertheless, let us read Ephesians 2, verse 11. This is from the RSV, in case your version doesn't exactly fit mine. Therefore, remember that one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near in the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law of commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new man, in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both in, to God in one body through the cross, therefore bringing the hostility to an end. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father, so then you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure is joined together and, and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built up into for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. When you're 85 years old and can't see, it's kind of hard to read, so <laughs> you all put up with me, I'm sure. Having started going to the Church of Christ when I was zero, I have spent a lifetime with people who love the Bible and know a lot about it. Uh, I got out of college and became a preacher for a while, and I'll say some more about that later. But I, f I found people that knew a lot of the Bible. But, but like me, when I started the college to study the Bible, seriously, I found out that they didn't know very much about the Bible. They knew the Bible, but they didn't know anything about the Bible. They just had them, and just assumed it sort of appeared by magic, and there it was. Uh, if you'll forgive me, I'd like to sort of relive my past a little bit and talk for a few minutes about the Bible, if you'll put up with me. Think about those old churches right after Jesus went to heaven. There they, they came in and they sang and they prayed and they got out their New Testament. No, 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 they didn't have the New Testament. What did they have? They had the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, 
And they had the Septuagint, which was a translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek uh, two, three hundred years earlier. Uh, they had the memorized sayings of Jesus. There were people who spent their whole time learning and they got it, they memorized it so they would get it exactly right because that was dear to them. The uh, they had the apostles, and so they did what they could. They they they, they made the best of it. Now it wasn't too long until they got some writings from Paul, several years, and some guys started writing gospels. That was also some years later. Big question of which came first, uh, Mark, which we think is the oldest of the Gospels, or Thessalonians, which we're pretty sure is the oldest of Paul's books. Nevertheless, there they were, and, and then they started collecting that stuff together. Uh, churches would share letters of Paul or Gospels or whatever they had. And so... In the ancient world, there were produced over many years in the neighborhood of what we still have, 5,000 partial or whole manuscripts of the New Testament. One of the big things about that uh, was uh, how did they produce them? One of the things they had is they had to uh, kind of a paper made out of lamb skin and uh, some of you some of you have seen way more of those than I have uh, when Judy and I started going to England years ago we went to the British Museum and at that time two of the oldest manuscripts uh, Sinead, or, uh, Alexandrinus and Alexandrinus uh, <coughs> and Sinead what did I say? <laughs> when I asked the other day for the one that I couldn't remember. No, no, that's the name of that stuff. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anybody want to? Anybody? Vaticanus, Alexandrinus. Tiny Atticus. Two of those, which I had studied extensively in college, were in the British Museum, and I got that close to them. There was a guard standing there, a little worried that I was going to touch it, but I was not. I, mean, I knew better than to do that. Uh, in case you've ever have seen an old uh, document like that, I brought one from, uh, this, is, this is not a Bible one. This is a British indenture on felt. Then this is from uh, April of 1765. So you know what those things look like. Uh, a lot of a lot of those old uh, manuscripts were on papyrus. They found them in the garbage uh, piles. They found them in all kinds of situations, and they, those got put together and collected. And they worked on that and produced uh, the precursor of the New Testament that 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 we have now. And that's a remarkable story how that all came about. Well, they didn't get it all together at once. Some churches would have some of this, and some churches would have another part of it. And the first time there is a list that is the same as our 27 books in the New Testament was from a festival letter by Athanasius in 367. So it took a while to get all that done, and here, here you and I are with our New Testaments intact, and we're really tickled about that. Now you said, why did you, why did you say all that stuff? Why were you, why were you bothered to do that? Because I need to talk about Ephesians and some stuff about it that is really important. <clears throat> we believe that Paul wrote four different groups of letters usually brought forth by some kind of misbehavior or need or some 
drive on his part to put together stuff. So let me run through that just real quick, just a second. We believe that the oldest, of course, is Thess Thessalonians. Think about how that came about. The early church were convinced that Christ was going to come back immediately. The immediate Perusia, that's called. The imminent Perusia. He's, he's going to be back just any time. It didn't happen. And they started, but as, as they got ready for that, what they did is they quit their jobs and all got together and uh, huddled, waiting for him to come, and he didn't come. Now, when people get together huddling and haven't got anything to do except stuff they ought to be doing, sometimes they do stuff they ought to be doing, and so he had to write to them about that. Get back to work. Uh, don't, don't be doing that kind of stuff. Well, of course, they had a big problem immediately with the Judaizing teachers, which we talked about in Galatians, and he was mad as a hornet about that. Uh, so he wrote about that. Well, he wrote some letters about that. And then later in life, we all know the story about his getting arrested in Jerusalem and thrown in jail and up and down the coast. And he, to save his life, he finally had to appeal to the Supreme Court. So he got sent to Rome and got shipwrecked and snake bit and all that stuff along the way. And while he's in prison there in Rome, he wrote four letters, of which Ephesians is a part. Uh, and they are very similar. A lot of times when you're reading Ephesians, you'll think, wait a minute, am I reading Colossians or Ephesians and vice versa? Now let's bring up a little point about that. In Colossians, one of these prison letters that he wrote, he said, have everybody read this. Well, share this with the other churches. And be sure and get and look at the letter that I wrote to the Laodiceans. Over. Where is the Laodicean letter? They lost it. Come on. Uh, did you ever get a letter from somebody you really loved and lost it? Mm -hmm. You saved it. That's what you did. So that brings up this point. When they were collecting the various things to put together, one book, uh, they got them from various sources. We believe that the church at Ephesus was one of those sources. They had a lot of, of, of the things that Paul had done. And so when they collected, they got a lot of things from, from Ephesus. In those ancient documents that looked like that, Ephesus is not there. Now, when you're doing old manuscripts, the closer you can get to the original, the better. We call those original ones autographs. And now, so Paul writes one, either himself or his amanuensis, and that's what we'd like to have is that original one, we haven't got any of those. Those three that we were talking about a while ago, then, you know, we're talking two, three hundred years later. But the farther back you can go, the better. In the very oldest of those manuscripts, Ephesus is not in the title. It is not written there. It's not on any of those. That was added later. Why was it added later? Because they got a lot of the stuff that they collected from the city of Ephesus, from the church there. So they just called it Ephesians. So that's a whole lot of talk to get to the point that if Ephesians is probably not Ephesians, generally agreed by advanced Bible scholars, including me. You mind not saying that? So I'm one of those. But, uh, I haven't spent a lifetime doing that. Uh, well, what? Let, let, there's two or three other reasons why they think that, it, that Ephesians may not, may not be Ephesians. In Paul's letters, he always talked about his friends. I want y'all to say hello to so and 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 so. He did not do that in Ephesians. He didn't say that. that in there. He didn't list people who needed to be greeted and all that. Uh, so, what, what, what might it be? 
I would say that the main opinion of scholars about it is that Ephesians was supposed to be an encyclical to be shared among several churches. It was supposed to be passed around, so he didn't he didn't put that stuff in there. I don't buy that. Uh, I, I think that's a real good theory, and obviously I understand that people way beyond my level think that. I think that Ephesians ought to be Laodicean. They didn't lose the Laodicea letter. You don't lose something precious like that. An inspired document. That, so they just didn't get that title in there. And, and I, all of my life, ever since I found out about that Laodicea business, I wanted to go over there and find it. <laughs> don't we love to find things? Uh, you all know, of course, that Judy and I collect Blue Willow China. And we have spent a lot of time looking for it and finding it and finding it. Drop a little money here and there and sometimes a lot of money. Uh, that's really exciting. So when I go over and find Layout of Scenes, well, I'll let you know. And, and we can all get together and have a party. I, I also uh, collect uh, antique pocket knives, vintage, vintage, vintage is the proper term. This is my granddad's uh, pocket knife, a 1920 case uh, Whittler. Uh, he wore it out and quit carrying it, and I got it from him. And of all the knives I've got, a couple hundred. This is the most precious. That because it's old, and I've got it there. And so that's how I feel about it the way I'm going to feel about layout of scenes when I go and find it. And the knife that I carry is, is a newer one. It's a 1935 King Cutter that a guy found for me and called me on the phone and said, I found that knife you've been looking for. So it's in the other pocket over here. I won't get it after. <clears throat> now, whether that's right or not, it's still, we still call it a fission because they, 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 they put that on there later. But it, it probably is not a fission. Probably a, an encyclical, leave that, lay out of scenes. Anyway, we got that taken care of. Could we agree that the Ephesians got it? <laughs> yeah. Please. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they got it and everything to pass it around. That way you and I won't have to get in a big Yeah. <laughs> Which position do you like? I like that it was written to the Ephesians. But uh, I, we'll go into that later. Okay. Because I'm teaching for Dale on December 10th. And uh, I'll bring it up then. Okay, good. Uh, could you just be sure and be here on the tent, okay? <laughs> I'd like to uh, take some, some things while we talk about Ephesians. Uh, in my interest in finding out about the Bible as well as, as, as the Bible itself. So I'd like to, I'd like to cut things into pieces to, to work on that for a while. And I'd like to start with uh, Paul. <laughs> My doctor's degree is in the psychology of religion. I spend a lot of time studying that stuff, so if you don't mind my saying a few things about it, I'd like to. But when I read Paul, I can't help reacting to things about him besides what he writes. The first one. He was very religious. What does that mean? Right, let me let me do a little confession here and a little word for you. I've worried my whole life because I wasn't as religious as I ought to be. When I started the college to study Bible, one of the things I found out real quick was that almost everybody in my class was more religious than I was. So I knew that that meant you ain't quite getting it. You're, you're not as far along about that as you ought to be. Paul had it. In my profession, we call that religion business the religious sentiment. What in the world does that mean? There are various things about it as you try to define what religion is. One is 
it is a it is a, an interest in ultimate concern. That is things that matter more than anything else. Famous theologian Paul Tilly, who escaped to America from Germany after Hitler went in, spoke of religion as being ultimate concern. And went on to say that all theology is eschatology. Eschatology means what is going to happen at the end. Our prayer was because we are older and closer, we want to be pure and be about the right business. Yes, that's what we want. We think about that all the time, don't we? I've thought about that since I was a boy. What is going to happen to me at the end? I guess I was about five or so when I found out that all living things die, <clears throat> including, wait a minute, me? Uh, are you talking about me? Yeah. Uh, that is our concern. We are concerned about what is going to happen to us at the end. There are other elements in defining religion. It is a concern with entities not observable with the ordinary senses. We deal with things and beings that we believe are there, though we don't see them. And I'm sure that you've had the experience, same as I have, that sometimes in the middle of a prayer, you wonder, are you there, or am I talking to myself? Religion says that you're there, and I believe it. I believe it matters because you have stuff that I don't have and can do things that I can't do. Human technology can go so far, and that's as far as it can go, and so we need help beyond that. It is, uh, religion is also the, the, the desire to worship, to uh, appreciate and honor beings and things greater than oneself. It is the desire to celebrate. We did that on Thanksgiving Day. <clears throat> Because I'm the oldest person in our whole family, I always am called on to lead the prayer of about 30. And trying to think of something to say when you're almost 86 years old is a little bit of a problem, especially when you're about to starve, because you've been waiting to get on a while for something to eat. Uh, all of that is, is what we mean by religion. Paul had large doses of that. It kind of happened in two phases. Uh, with him. There was the Jewish phase where he was pretty sure that everybody in the church was evil. He was going to do everything he could do to stamp them out, and we talked about that at great length. And then when he got the word, uh, he spent the rest of his life thinking about almost nothing else. That was, that was on his mind all the time. In my confession, that's what concerns me about my religion. I think about other things every once in a while. I think about blue willow dishes, about what time is the time to get up, is my tea ready, and all that on and on and on and on. Paul was relentless in thinking about that. Now, he went through the awfulest kinds of situations. Probably the one that bothers me as much as any other one is when they built that fire and that snake came out and beat him and was hanging on his arm. Uh, <laughs> that gives me the willies. I need to tell you, that, that really bothers the heck out of me. He got beaten. He was uh, kicked out of town. Uh, he was left for dead and everything else. When I think about that, I think about an old man at Waco. They announced that he was going to have surgery the next day, and he was a guy that I kind of liked. So I was talking to him, and I said, uh, let me ask you, are you afraid? No. He said, I've had 14 surgeries, so I'm not afraid. I know what to do. I know I can, I know I can stand it. <clears throat> I'll add one other thing, and then I'll get off Paul talking about his personality. When I finished with my classes at Baylor, it was time for me to write a book. They call it a dissertation. You are supposed to add some original knowledge to the store of the world's knowledge. You're supposed to, you're supposed to add something that nobody else has done. That's a pretty big challenge to start with because try to think of something that nobody else has ever said and you've got a, and you've got a problem. 
I was afraid I couldn't make myself do that. When you know yourself well, uh, you know how you are and what you can do and what you can't do. I, I knew myself well that I'm good at messing around. Uh, when people ask me, uh, what you've been doing? My, my pattern about that is, I come about as close as a human being can come to doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> human beings can't do nothing, but I come real close. I had to write that book, and so what I did was to set myself a rigid schedule, start writing at 8 o'clock in the morning, and work until 5 with a couple of breaks for the round. And don't ever violate that, and I did, and that's how I got through writing that book. And I made up my mind that I would never, ever do that again. People always say, when are you going to write your book about, book about child discipline? Oh, about a week or ten days, which means never. <laughs> you know how much stuff he wrote and how he did it using a, a quill and ink and whatever else? <clears throat> Probably with his old bum eyes, which are worse than mine. You could tell a while ago when I was reading that I couldn't see. Could you? He wrote an enormous amount of stuff. That was on his mind all the time. Nothing else mattered. This world was real in that he had to deal with it, but it didn't matter. If you were a slave, that's okay. Uh, it doesn't matter. Let, let's talk a minute about prison. We've got a new son-in-law in our family, which we're real happy about. He's a lawyer. He was telling me the other day that when he was a boy playing football in Eastern Oklahoma, he got recruited by the Air Force. They wanted him to come and play football for them. He's, when you see him, he's about 6'4". And, well, that's enough of that. But he, he got everything I was supposed to get, but I was behind the door. <laughs> He's thinking about going to the Air Force Academy. His father, who is his guy that we like a lot, was a wise man said to him, Son, think about this. You don't like for anybody to tell you what to do. <laughs> do we know anybody like that? I, I don't know anybody like that. So you're, gonna speak, you're about to spend a lifetime being told everything to do. He didn't go to the Air Force Academy. He went to OU and studied law, and now he's a big shot lawyer. Got him, so I'm going to be suing everybody out of that. We've got him, got him in defense so we can do all that. Prison. Now, Paul was not in a dungeon. Luke says about him that he lived in his own place, uh, and people were able to come and go. But he was hooked up to a guard. Now, we all know people that have to be dealt with. Judy and I have got some grandkids like that. Uh, one of them that we just mentioned a while ago, uh, they're uh, having COVID at their house. Is she nine now, Judy? Asked her parents to buy her for her birthday a nice pet, a snake. <laughs> I've already said about me and snakes. When I was young, I measured land for the government, cotton, wheat, and peanuts. And I had to be around a lot of snakes. So I had to kind of get over being afraid of them. But I never did get to like them. So I said to them and that little girl, I really love you. I love everything you do. I want to be interested in everything about you, but I don't want anything to do with that snake. I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to see it. I'm not going to come to your house. I'm not going to have anything at all to do about that snake. Well, there it is. He's in prison, and he is going to be dealt with. How did that work out for them? I'm guessing it happened like this. The, 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 these, these people are called the Praetorian Guard, the people that are, that are watching. The Praetorian Guard 
sometimes just called the Praetorium, which is a, bit, a little bit more than just the guard. They were the biggest, strongest, smartest, most dangerous of all the Romans. These were some bad guys. I'm guessing that when he was there in his house, hooked on to this soldier, and he started talking to somebody that came to see him about the faith, the guys probably said, you need to shut that up. No, I'm not going to shut that up. I'm going to, I'm going to talk. Paul had prayed, that, had said that he would hope his brethren would pray for him, that he would speak with boldness. He wasn't about to shut up. He kept on talking about that. Now, when you see, here's a guy tied to him, having to listen to that night and day, and after a while, he just couldn't find it anymore. And so some of them, we, we know from what, from what Paul says and what Luke says, that some of them fall in. Can I get in on that deal? Can a Roman soldier be a Christian? Oh, yeah. And the word got around this guy that's got to be dealt with. He's a, he's a mess. He just thinks that everything is about him and what he's thinking about. The word got around to what he was doing, and even in Caesar's household, some of his family joined in. Prison. But let's add a little bit to that. When you think about people in prison, you think about people that are unhappy. They're mad. They all are innocent. Everybody in prison didn't do it. And if they did, it was somebody else's fault. And if they did it, they won't ever do it again. Not a word of that in, in there anywhere. And, and then when you get out of prison, your life's a terrible mess. And one common thing about it is depression. You, just kinda, you, you can just kind of sink into a stupor. Well, life is so bad, what am I going to get out of it? One thing in common of those four letters that Paul wrote while he was there, there's not a word there. Not a word. And I think, mm, boy, that's, that's some kind of metal besides what I've got in me. Because when I get mistreated, I get mad. I'm not able to talk bad to you, at least talk loud. Uh, not in the word. So one of the things I want to point out about prison right off the bat is it's not like Thessalonians. He ate them out. Y'all need to quit doing that stuff that you're doing and get to work and, and, uh, and do, do what you're supposed to do. And we, and we must have said 50 times in Galatians, he was mad as a honey. He took the skin off of them in Galatians and on and on. No, 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 no. He is cheerful. Um, with all this work that he's doing, with his old bad eyes, those four letters, uh, and particularly one of them in, in Philippians, is the word is rejoice. We've just got so much stuff going on that's so good. Just celebrate, rejoice, and all that. Okay, well I'll get, I'll get, I'll get right on that. I'll, I'll, I'll do that when I when I get back to you. Now. That's enough wasting time on that. Let's talk about this, this, what we read. There's several things of importance there, but the one that I want to focus on is the one that's preeminent in that whole thing, and that is the matter of alienation. <clears throat> you all were a bunch of dead dogs. You were living, you were dead in sin. Uh, you were separated from God and Christ and the and the covenants, and the commonwealth of Israel, you had nothing. <clears throat> I remember that one uh, Christmas Eve when I was preaching in Texas, which I'm going to say some stuff about in a minute. My love life wasn't going well. The night before Christmas, the whole business had imploded. I, the, the elder said, we'll let you uh, the guys that ruled the church that, that, that they weren't elders, they were rulers. 
<laughs> so we're, we're going to let you go home tomorrow for your family. And as I drove out of town, I thought, I will never, ever feel good again. That is the essence of grief. When, when you're grieving, there's the feeling that I will never, ever feel good again. What I say to people when they are grieving is, I know that you feel that way, but that is not how it is. You will heal up if you give yourself a chance, and you will feel better. You will forget that, but you will feel better. These people, he says, were without hope in the world. Things were as bad as they could be, and now they're not. Because Christ came preaching peace and reconciliation, and so you're not alienated anymore. I need to talk about being alienated for a few minutes. We had that civil war, the little tip, where people didn't get along very well. I believe the number is 620,000 people were killed. I was born just in time to miss World War II. A little disagreement where about 60 million died. When we think about our world that we live in right now, people are not getting along very well. Uh, the first news is Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. We all like to talk about unity. Jesus prayed for unity in religion. I've got a book that I bought when I was in school in Abilene that was it's got over 375 Christian uh, groups in it. Not anywhere close to being together. But I want to do two different ones for my life. First of all, right out of college. All of a sudden, I graduate. And I've got a degree in Bible, and I'm young and full of vinegar. And I get a job preaching at Itasca, Texas. Who knows where Itasca is? It's between Fort Worth and Waco, halfway. It's almost completely gone now. It was almost gone then, and I just about did it in when I was got there. Dairy Queen. They did, but we didn't have it then. <laughs> well, we had them with Dorothy's Cafe. She was a red-headed woman that put up with me and fed me uh, when, when I would go there. The story of this church was, in two or three years before that, they had had a war. They had built a building, and nothing went right. And these two groups, they divided up. And what they told me when I took that job was, we have more people in this town who are members of this church who never go than who do. And your job is to get them back in. I'm a 22-year-old firebrand. Well, okay. Give me something to do. I'll, I'll whoop that job out of nothing flat. And I went to work on it. Let's take guesses. How many people did I get back in over a three-year period? None. Nary a woman. They told me stuff like, we know we need to get started back. We did, we know that. And we're going to. Hmm. So I thought of all the smart things I could say uh, and all the positions I could take that would protect that. And I use them, trust me. And I, when it comes to conniving, I'm pretty good. I'm about as good at that as I am at doing nothing. I connived and, and schemed, uh, and I didn't give them a, a, a single one of them back. That alienation was so powerful that they, I don't know if they wanted to overcome it or not, but they didn't. Nary a woman. But that was not the main one. That was just three years. And I need to say that it was a good three years for me because I thought I was supposed to be a preacher. Found out that I wasn't. But I had a great time with those people. I was a single man and I lived with them night and day. And they fed me and all that stuff. So it was great. But my profession, the site professor, most of 50 years, and I did a little counseling on the side, marriage and family counseling. And people came to see me who were married and were not sure they wanted me. They, they, wanted, they, they wanted me to fix them. 
How many of those? Don't, don't say zero here. It's not zero, but it's close. <laughs> I don't know why they got married in the first place. I often ask them the question, why did you all get married? You all don't like each other very well. And they said, no, we don't. Uh, but then the next question was, is there anything left to work with to, to, be, to be glad that you're together? And a few times it was yes, and sometimes it wasn't. But that business of being alienated, even from one's better self, shrink people like to talk about being alienated from yourself, meaning I can't quite get in touch with who I am and what I need to be doing, is widespread. That's where they had been. They were dead in their sins and alienated from everything that mattered. And Jesus fixed that. Are we happy about that? Now that was written to them. That was old, 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 old. But because it was special, we apply that to ourselves today. And so we can be not alienated from ourselves, from one another, and hopefully from uh, not anybody, if it's up to us. Somebody asked me one time, if you could put the New Testament in one single word, what would it be? The word is fellowship. Tell do you still go to the church of Christ? I sure do. Give me three reasons. I'll give you one right quick, and that is I like other people. I like how they think. I like what they're about. I like what they mean to me. And I need that. And I, and I, I rejoice. Let's pray just a minute. Lord, thank you for let us be together here in all kinds of places. Help us be even closer than we've been before. Be about your business. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank y'all.